On this week's episode of Truth Uncoiled, we are breaking down the Brian Koberger case. On this episode, I am bringing more of a legal perspective so we can look at the evidence that we know the prosecution has and if it is going to be enough to convict Brian Koberger of the murders of those four innocent college students in the trial that is going to be happening in June 2025. So come along with me. It's going to be really exciting. Let's talk about it. This has been a murder that just obviously shook the world. Why? First of all, they were four college students, so young, so innocent. Second, it was done in their home in where they thought they would, you know, the safety, the sanctity of where you live. And these four college students had so much more life to live. As you know, Brian Koberger has not been convicted, but we're going to talk a lot about the case, the evidence we believe that is there, and what's going to happen going forward. So the first major thing we've got to talk about is that the judge in the case has officially um, stated that trial is going to happen in June of 2025. This is a little disappointing for the families who want closure and are not going to be able to get it until there is a conviction. but. Brian Koberger earlier in 2023 waived his right to a speedy trial. Once you waive your right to a speedy trial, the defense and the prosecutor can basically continue the case um, until they believe that their case is ready and perfected for trial. What's interesting about this case is that the legalese behind it, the what I would say the lawyer shenanigans. I mean, that's really a bad description of it, but I believe that there have been some shenanigans that have happened that are happening to basically either defend Brian Koberger and then what the prosecution are doing to put together a case. I wanted to first start out. When you're looking at a criminal case, you have two parties, right? You have the prosecution who have done their due diligence to believe that there is enough evidence to bind this over for a trial that they believe that they can get a guilty verdict. You have to remember, if the prosecution takes a case all the way to trial and they then lose or the juror comes back and finds that they're not guilty, even if a major piece of evidence is then discovered after the trial, prosecution can never retry Brian Koberger for that crime. Again, we are in our constitution says that you have the right against double jeopardy. And that is exactly what double jeopardy is. So a prosecutor never wants to bring a case too early. They want to make sure that there is enough evidence. This goes into the case of Casey Anthony, and we could talk about that. But, you know, they decided to take that case forward before they found the body. And that's a lot of times when a body is not found in a murder They do not press charges quite yet because it is very hard to prove the murder without a body. Well, in this case, obviously, Brian Koberger, the four college students were found in their home murdered, and um, that wasn't an issue. But they then needed to do a lot of unraveling of how they were going to find the person that did this. Now they are going to put together this case and they are going to be ready for that case in June of 2025. The other thing that is really interesting is that Idaho has the death penalty, and so the prosecution is going straight for the death penalty. Let's talk about that for a little bit. Idaho prosecutor could have decided to possibly give a plea deal to the defendant, Brian Koberger. So the prosecutor could have decided, hey, listen, we will take off the death penalty if you plead guilty. But in this case, prosecution believes that they have such strong evidence that they have not offered any kind of plea. They want to go to the death penalty. There's a different level to find in a death penalty case. Not only do you have to prove to the jury and you have to get a guilty verdict, but then there's going to be a sentencing phase and the the courts, they're going to then have to prove that this crime rose to the level of such viciousness that the death penalty should be, you know, given. I think if the prosecutor gets a guilty verdict that there is, that this is such a vicious crime that the death penalty would be warranted. And not to mention there's four people that were murdered in this case. So, so that's another element. You want to make sure the prosecution is doing it right. So even though you might be frustrated, like, why is it taking so long? From a lawyer's perspective, I am thinking two things. Brian Koberger got no bail. So he is sitting in jail. He is not out waiting for trial. So that's the first thing I'm like, why do we care? 
it, we, we let it go for as long as it, he's it, behind bars. But the second thing is, is because of this, um, we want the prosecution to have the best case possible. And that's why if it takes him till June, 2025 to do that, we want that. Now on the defense side, their job is to obviously make sure that their client who claims he's innocent, Brian Koberger maintains his innocent. Their job is twofold. First of all, you need to know this because a lot of people are like, why would the pro why would a, this a defense attorney represent Brian Koberger? First of all, this is a public defender because Brian Koberger claims he couldn't afford an attorney. That's their job. They are public defenders to represent defendants. Pro a defense attorney's job is never to know the truth. That's not their job because clients lie all the time and they're not the the truth finder. They're, it's not their job to find out whether Brian Koberger is lying or not. Their job is, because he says he's innocent, is to make sure that the prosecution um, does their job, does it correctly, does it without impropriety or, or you know, viciousness. Um, and their job is to create reasonable doubt. When you look at the scales of justice, um, a lot of people are like, well, why is it a scale? Well, I look at that as that is the that is the the prosecutor and the defense without either of them doing the job that they're doing, you would not have the balance of justice. There is a lot of problems with our judicial system. There is a lot of corruptness that goes into it. But I look at it as that without both sides, you would have so much more of that. I mean, you would have just it, it wouldn't work. So even though you want to say, well, why would the defense attorney represent? No, that, this is how we keep the balance of our judicial system in check is what they're doing. Now, that doesn't mean that I believe that this this defense attorney for Brian Koberger is not pulling all the stops to do what is ever necessary to try to get Brian Koberger off. And um, from a lawyer lens, when you look at the evidence that the prosecution has, um, I think it's overwhelming in um, saying that, that Brian Koberger did these murders. Um, but again, innocent until proven guilty, it will be the prosecutor's job to convince a juror panel that he did these crimes. And therefore we want to make sure that these prosecutors have the opportunity to do their job, get all the evidence necessary, and then present their case to the best possible. One of the things that is happening is the defense counsel filed a motion to transfer the case. They are claiming that there is no way that there could be an impartial jury in this small town. Um, and therefore, Brian Koberger cannot get a fair trial. Um, there's a lot of sense in that because Moscow oh, is not a big town. And, but the judge, as of right now, has denied that. The judge has said, nope, we can get an impartial jury here. But the next thing that they did, which was just, in my mind, mind boggling, was that the defense counsel sent out a survey to, I don't know, a lot of potential jurors in this town, asking them specific questions about the case. And, um, you know, that was what the prosecutors argued as basically juror tampering. Like they were purposely doing this to try to get it so these jurors would get struck from the jury and it would be impossible to find a jury panel and therefore they would have to move the case. As of right now, the judge has ruled no. That's not enough. They, the judge has allowed the surveys to go forward, which was a little bit sh surprising. Um, but the judge, as of right now, has said this is staying in this town. If the judge decides that it needs to be moved and the trial needs to move, be moved out of Lata County, um, then obviously the trial date set for June 2nd of next year will most likely be moved. I think that them being able to get the trial date set, I think that at least gives us something to work toward the prosecutors now know discovery needs to be done. Um, and, and we're going to get, you know, probably a little bit more information. There'll be, will be a lot of motions filed regarding limiting evidence and different things that we'll be able to break down once that happened. Now that the trial date is, is happening again, the case can also be stalled for these pretrial motions, which again, will be very frustrating for the family, but because Brian Koberger waived his right to a speedy trial, it's just going to be a matter. They're just going to need to be patient. And luckily, I think some of the families understand that. They understand that they want the prosecutors to have the best evidence out there. And um, and, we'll, and eventually they're going to be able to get their day, their day in court. Now, the defense counsel 
Attorneys are arguing that prosecutors are withholding key evidence. Attorneys for Koberger argued in front of the judge on May 2nd of this year, 2024, that prosecutors were withholding that evidence. When you get evidence in a case, it is the attorney's responsibility to turn that evidence over. But the timing of when you have to turn that evidence over is, it can be interpreted in the way that the court wants you to do it. So um, a lot of times, especially in a defense, um, in a criminal case, you believe that that evidence should be turned over immediately. But that's not necessarily the case. There's the rules of civil procedure that outline when evidence needs to be disclosed. And so long as it is disclosed under those um, guidelines, then you know, a lot of times the court is saying it's fine. But if they have that evidence and they have it for a certain amount of time, that's what the, the defense attorneys are saying that they are, they're not turning it over. Um, they believe that they haven't turned over parts of a video that allegedly show a vehicle matching Koberger's car at the scene of the video, the, the murders. Um, so that's obviously a big issue, like being if they have an actual video of Koberger's car. So one of the biggest things is that in Idaho, they allow alibis. So if you have an alibi, you have to give that alibi before a certain amount of time. And in Koberger's case, the defense attorneys kept saying that he has an alibi. But they kept like delaying when they had to turn over the alibi. And the judge kept giving them a little bit more time. Hey, here's when you have to disclose your alibi. And as an attorney, I kept just thinking, oh my gosh, if you have it, you either have an alibi or you don't. Like it shouldn't be in a matter of time because the defense counsel has to just write it down. Like it has to be very, you know, they have to provide all the evidence to what their alibi is. So finally, the judge was like, you have to turn in your alibi at this time. Um, and, or you don't get to have an alibi anymore. And so Brian Koberger's team finally disclosed his alibi. And I'm telling you as an attorney, it was so weak. I mean, the alibi was not that somebody else saw me or somebody else can attest to where I was that night. That's usually what you think an alibi is, right? But it was, he likes to take long drives at night by himself. And he's done it before. He likes doing it. And therefore that's what he was doing that night. He was just out for a long drive. I mean, I I did, I just was like, that is so weak. That is such a weak alibi. And I it just didn't make sense to me because in my mind, an alibi is, hey, friend, you were, saw me that night. So you have to write an affidavit saying that you saw me and therefore that's my alibi. And this was just weak. And I think the prosecutors were also like, what a weak alibi, which is another reason why I don't think the prosecutors are offering a plea to I think that this is going to go all the way to trial because they want the death penalty for it. And obviously the, the back and forth between the prosecutor and the defense about how they're withholding evidence. And they're like, we're not doing anything inappropriate. Like we're just trying to, to build up our case so that we're ready for trial. And already like Koberger's defense attorneys have, um, you know, they've asked for multiple hearings to discuss the surveillance video and to discuss the discovery um, materials. The other thing is, is that they, the defense team wants to keep this case private. So they have been very vocal and filed motions to keep hearings and motions private. And the judge has granted it to an extent. Um, there's a gag order in place. So all the attorneys can't talk about it. And then also there's limit to what we get out of the court, court. but um, the documents are still, are still, um, you know, we're able to get after the fact. So it's not fully to where we're not going to be able to see what's going on in the case. It's just sometimes we don't, we get the information afterwards, which is sometimes a little bit frustrating when we're trying to report on what is going on. So just a little bit about some of the evidence that's going to be used in this trial. We found out some of it because the arrest warrant affidavit was finally unsealed and we were able to get some of the evidence, but this is early on evidence. And I believe that the prosecution has actually a lot more evidence now, but like the knife sheath was found at the scene of the murder and the DNA on the knife sheath went all the way back to um, Brian Koberger's parents' house. That was when they were investigating. Brian Koberger drove his car all the way back to back east to his family home. They were investigating him. They were able to get a sample for DNA. They were able to connect the knife sheath to the DNA. Um, Obviously, that's the biggest piece of evidence. There's cell phone records showing that, you know, he was pinged in and out of the area about the same time as the murders. Um, and then obviously there was witnesses that saw a white Hyundai Elantra, which is the same car that he was driving. In fact, the night when the murders happened, 
that was their first thing is they were looking for that car. And that's how they were able to deduce down to Brian Koberger because they were able to find cars within a certain amount of area that was the exact same car. And um, I mean, all of this was outlined in the affidavit, which brought the charges. And now I believe that there's even more evidence, more DNA evidence. There's going to be, obviously there was two um, roommates that were left um, alive. Um, one of them witnessed or saw the murder. Um, so that testimony is going to be really big. Um, she has gone through a very traumatic experience, but um, I think that probably she's getting help. And by the time that she has to testify for court, she's going to be really, really important you know, important. Once they were able to pinpoint Koberger as the crime suspect, they were able to get cell phone records. And then they were able to obviously put him through traveling through Pullman, Washington around 2.47 a.m. on the night of the murders. Just a lot of this evidence that is going to be put together, but it's really important for the prosecutors to be able to do it in a succinct timeline and then that they're able to really pinpoint all of the evidence onto Brian Koberger and then they're going to be able to convince a jury that he is guilty of these murders and once the trial happens we'll be able to kind of lay you know see all of that evidence that I, like I said I don't think there's going to be any major surprises at the trial um but there's going to it's going to be able to be unfold uh a juror is going to be able to hear it and then they're going to be able to find if he's guilty or not guilty if they find he's guilty There'll be a second, basically, mini trial that will then determine sentencing, and that will determine whether he gets the death penalty or um, life in prison, very, very similar to Chad Daybell and how he was just sentenced to the death penalty as well. So very interesting case. When you look through a legal lens of it, the evidence that is needed, what's going to happen, how the defense is working their case to try to show that Brian Kohlberger, who claims he's innocent, is innocent, um, how they're doing that. Um, how that you know they're pulling out all the stops to make sure the prosecution's doing their job that they're doing it right um all the motions that are filed remember that they're doing it because they want to preserve the record they want to preserve a pill if necessary so it's very interesting how this is working out and obviously the biggest cases of these um attorneys career and they want to do it right on both sides but at the end we want to make sure the scales of justice are done appropriately so that if brian koberger is convicted it's not overturned on appeal because of something that happened you know why we were prepping to go to trial so it will be very very interesting and we'll see what happens and see if this case goes to june 2025 and to see what if you know finally we can get some you know, movement and closure for these families. But that's another episode of Truth Uncoiled. Stick around for next week's episode.